Today on BRS TV, we're going to start a new series on aquarium lighting for reef tanks. For those of us who have been in the hobby for a while, we've seen a really dramatic change in lighting options, as well as a much better understanding of what's required to properly light a reef tank. What the hobby collectively knows about proper lighting is more or less a combination of scientific data mixed with personal experiences and educated guesses. Based on that, we're going to try and focus on the information that most closely attempts to emulate a natural reef environment since that is the environment that we know with 100% certainty to be a successful reef building environment. One thing I think is important to remember while we talk about all this is, there are many ways to be successful with a reef tank and there are various degrees of success. Generally speaking, the closer we get to emulating the sun, the closer we are to emptying our wallets out as well. Don't feel like you have to spend a fortune or implement really elaborate techniques to light a reef tank successfully because that isn't the case. It's just like most things in this world, Additional time, effort, and resources will often be seen in the results. In today's episode, the primary focus will be on how corals utilize light, the different types of light available to corals in the ocean, and how we can utilize available light technologies to emulate a natural reef environment. A vast majority of corals kept in our hobby are primarily photosynthetic, meaning most of their energy comes from light. In this case, the energy actually comes from a symbiotic algae known as zooxanthellae, which lives within the coral's tissue. The zooxanthellae utilizes energy from the sun combined with carbon dioxide and water in a photosynthetic process that typically results in the creation of glucose, glycerol, amino acids, and oxygen for the corals. Corals utilize these elements to produce proteins, fats, and carbohydrates for metabolic function and growth. During this process, the coral releases carbon dioxide and nitrogen, which are in turn utilized by the zooxanthellae in a natural symbiosis that provides a healthy nutrient cycle for both coral and zooxanthellae. So basically every conversation we have about providing proper light for our corals is really more about providing proper light for the species of zooxanthellae that lives within that particular coral. There seems to be a wide array of zooxanthellae types that have adapted to various types of intensities of light. To get a better understanding, it is probably best to discuss the four basic types of light available to corals and their zooxanthellae in the ocean. The first of which is light direct from the sun. This is the most intense form of light available to corals, but is very directional and intensity varies throughout the day based on the position in the sky, as well as things like moving clouds. The sky is also a major source of light. Since the sky is more evenly illuminated, this form of light is more diffused and consistent. Light is also reflected off the substrate, like rock and sand, back up to the corals. This form of light is also diffuse and fairly even as well. The last major form of light found in the ocean is commonly referred to as shimmer. These shimmer lines are forms of light produced by surface ripples, which magnify the sun's rays. This creates a strobe-like effect of fast-moving, very intense light. The goal in the reef aquarium is basically to replicate these light sources in the tank as close as possible. In the past, most of this conversation revolved around providing enough light, which is most commonly measured with a PAR meter. However, most of today's lighting technologies are capable of providing more than enough PAR to maintain a very diverse reef tank, so a conversation that revolves purely around PAR seems a bit stale and dated. The conversation reefers are now having are typically about which lighting sources best emulate the natural ocean environment, as well as which has the best initial purchase value, lowest cost of ownership, and longest lifespan. Set a budget and get the best combination of these things possible within that budget. In most cases, completely ignoring one of these things is probably a mistake. We're going to focus on the first part, which is how to use the different light sources to emulate the reef environment. First thing we need to do is make sure we have enough power to support the corals. It's important to note that power is not horsepower, or more is always better. In fact, too much light is probably much more likely to kill corals in most reef tanks than not enough. Each coral and its unique zones and thalli have adapted over a very long time to particular light intensities and variances throughout the day. Providing more than it's used to is more likely to hurt metabolic function and growth rates than help stimulate them. In fact, it's believed that some corals temporarily shut down the photosynthetic process during periods where light is too intense, which might hinder growth. It's also not uncommon for corals to release all of its zooxanthellae and bleach when the light is too intense for prolonged periods of time. Many of these corals die shortly after. So how much PAR is enough? Some of the first attempts at figuring this out was to measure the PAR at midday in a reef environment. 
while this is a start, this is only representative of a couple of hours a day. If you add in clouds, water turbidity from storms, and seasonal changes, this number is really only representative of a tiny fraction of the overall lighting period. If we were to provide this much light for prolonged periods of time, we would end up killing a vast majority of corals. Ideally, we do want to try to emulate these natural changes in intensity by gradually increasing and decreasing the light throughout the day. This can be done as simply as turning on a portion of bulbs at different times, and some of the more advanced lighting systems have the ability to dim the bulbs or even emulate clouds and storms. The cloud or storm feature may seem like kind of a gimmick or just a visually cool feature, but many people feel like they provide real value by providing short rest periods or downtime where the coral can process the buildup of excess toxins produced during photosynthesis. Some reefers believe the buildup of these toxins might be one of the events that trigger a coral to expel the zooxanthellae and bleach out. We would also like to provide the strobing effect provided by the shimmer lines. These are essentially strong erratic pulses of light. Pulse lighting like this has been shown to be an effective way to commercially grow algae, but there haven't been many studies to discuss the effect these pulses have on coral growth. While this form of light certainly isn't a requirement, it is part of their natural environment they have evolved around and something we try to emulate if possible. From a pure aesthetic perspective, the shimmer is also visually attractive. I think the best reference I have heard is the shimmer transforms an aquarium from something that looks like a picture of an ocean to an actual living reef in your home. The three most commonly used light sources for the aquarium are fluorescent, metal halide, and LED lamps. All these light sources have evolved enough that you can be successful with any of them individually, but some of the best solutions incorporate two or more of these technologies together. Fluorescent lighting has been around for a long time and something that has been commonly used on lower demand tanks and a supplemental light for a complete reef tank. With the advent of high output T5 bulbs, this type of lighting has really transformed into something appropriate for basically any tank. The long tubes emit a diffused light that illuminates the tank fairly evenly with few shadows very similar to the way the sky lights the ocean. It's also easy to adjust the intensity of the light by turning some of the tubes on or off. It is pretty common to create a dusk or dawn periods by only turning on a few bulbs for a few hours in the morning and evening. However, the diffused nature of this lighting won't create any of the shimmer lines. Metal halide lighting is a directional single source of light, fairly similar to the sun and will create the shimmer lines we have been talking about. The intensity of the light at different points of the tank is somewhat limited by the placement of the bulb and the aquascape. Single points of light like this have shadowing effects where power levels will be lower and something to think about when designing the system. If you are fairly ambitious, you can use light tracks or sun systems to move the halide bulbs. This will recreate the natural shadowing effect of the sun passing through the sky and the different intensities that will produce. Costs and space requirements make this relatively an uncommon install. Something much more common is combining fluorescent and metal halide lighting to add elements very similar to the sky and sun to the tank. This will result in somewhat more evenly illuminated tank that maintains the shimmers halides are known for. The different bulb types also make it really easy to increase and decrease the intensity of the lighting throughout the day. The most recent addition to aquarium lighting is LED lamps. This is a single source type of lighting similar to metal halides, but what makes it different is the large volume of light sources. The result is a shimmer similar to those produced by halides and the potential for a nice even light source because the LEDs are often spread out fairly well. The similarity to skylight or sunlight will largely be dependent on the individual manufacturer's design. Large arrays of lower wattage LEDs will be closer to the sky and large single source LEDs or those with fairly focused lenses will be much closer to the sun. There are also a few which seem to be designed to function as both by providing large arrays of LEDs and advanced programming options to control them in unique ways. One of the nice things with LEDs is how easy they are to dim and the direct control over the individual colors. This means it is really easy to create a natural light intensity arc that is extremely similar to nature. Most of the good ones also have easy programming options for clouds or storms. Some of the really advanced models even allow for sunrise and set options, which emulate the even illumination of the sky and natural travel of the sun without expensive, difficult to implement light tracks. That wraps up today's episode. Future episodes in the series will give some fairly in-depth information on each type of lighting. If you would like to be notified when they come out, subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit BulkReefSupply.com and sign up for our newsletter. Thank you for watching BRS TV.